Hello, I'm Brett Nelson, the director at Sly Park Outdoor Education Center. We're excited that you'll be heading out to do a lesson on survival by design with fern and obsidian. Hey, Obsidian, what's happening? Hey, Fern, uh, I just decided today that I'd try something that I think a lot of our students do. When I was getting dressed this morning, instead of paying attention to local weather reports, I decided just to look out the window, and I saw some blue skies at that time and dressed for the warm weather. Well, you look cold. Yeah, I'm, I'm freezing. Well, maybe we should do a lesson today about heat and how it transfers from one thing to another. That's a great idea. Let's do it. Let's take this exploration of the concept of thermal energy to the Sly Park Labs. We will investigate what thermal energy is, how it moves in our world, how you can utilize this knowledge to stay warm in a shelter overnight, and more. I happen to have a piece of equipment right here that can help us what? monitor your heat loss. What? So check this out. I can look here and take a picture and notice where your heat is moving. I see that a lot of heat is coming from your legs and your arms and your face, that you're radiating that heat out. That's called radiation. You're right, I'm not very well insulated, but I did notice that this rock is really warm. It's actually conducting heat from the bottom up. When I'm touching the rock, I'm actually soaking in some of that heat. I think that's called conductive heat. And then all this heat that, that radiates out, it's moving throughout our atmosphere and that warm air is rising and those are called convection currents. Yeah, I've heard of that before. If you ever like sitting next to a campfire and you notice that the side that's facing the campfire is really warm while the, while the side that's facing away is really cold, that's because that hot air rising up from the campfire is drawing in cold air behind it. That is a convection current. Whoa, slow down. Let's review while looking at thermal imagery. Remember, thermal energy is just another way of saying heat. Red and orange show the heat of an object. Blues and greens show the lack of heat of an object. The rock in obsidian's legs are red. That is radiant heat you're seeing right there. As mammals, we are warm-blooded, which means we produce our own heat from within as we burn calories. The heat obsidian feels from the radiation of the rock to his body is called conduction, a direct transfer of heat from one surface to another. The movement of heat in the air is called convection. I think we can apply these concepts of how heat moves through our world into making a shelter. Well, you know, before we go build shelters, I have got to change. I'm freezing. Now that you know a little bit about heat movement or thermal transfer as we like to call it, let's look around your house. What are some sources of radiant heat inside your house? Remember the solar heated rock and obsidian's legs? Look for things that give off heat. What kind of heat transfer happens if you were to touch the radiant heat source? Please don't experiment with this one if it's an oven or an iron. And finally, convection currents are going to cause the warm air to go where in your house? Welcome back. I put on some warm layers. I'm feeling so much better. It's still cold here at Sly Park. Of course, we have snow on the ground this time of the year. Uh, but what do you think about actually drawing our ideas for a shelter? That's a great idea to get our plans out before we head down to the cold shelter valley. Yeah, it's great to get stuff written down as opposed to just talking about it. It kind of formalizes our plans. Let's do it. A shelter's basic function is to keep weather out and warmth in while you're inside. While we are designing, think about structures that you can implement to avoid heat loss. Think about your knowledge of conduction and convection. Think about your knowledge of insulation and how to maximize heat retention. Oh yeah. You ready? I am ready. When we reveal our designs, here we go on the count of three. One, two, three. Oh, nicely done. Yeah, nicely done. you too. Yeah, hey, I see you have a tree in yours too. Yeah, yeah, I have a tree for structural stability. 
Nice, yeah, the trees out here at Sly Park have been here for at least, you know, 20, 30, maybe even 100 years. They've been through windstorms, snowstorms, all that good stuff, and they've stood the test of time. Why not make them part of your foundation? It makes too much sense. Right. I even included a stabilizing rock at the end of my ridge pole so that the ridge pole will stay secure against that tree. Oh, that's a great idea to keep that, that, that ridge pole. I like to, to go ahead and label things, keep that ridge pole from sliding out. It's a great idea. I noticed that you added insulation to yours and I completely forgot. Yeah, insulation kind of stops those air molecules from transferring heat and uh, by having more of it, you can actually keep your shelter warmer. Now, usual times of the year, so drier times of the year, we'd use things like needles and leaves to, to, to act as our insulation barrier. But this time of year, we got free insulation. In fact, you're sitting on some right now. Snow. Yeah, that's a great idea. Great idea. Now I cut my shelter nice and low so that the warmth would stay nice and near my body if I needed to sleep the Oh, night. that makes too much sense. So I built mine, I, I put six feet tall because I'm 6'3", and uh, you know, I wanted to be able to stand up and stretch out, but you're right, all that heat would be escaping from my body and hovering above my head instead of keeping me warm. Awesome. And I made sure I put a small door Notice you have a big door, but my door is small to try and minimize heat loss. Oh, that makes too much sense. Yeah, I, I did mine big because I'm kind of a bigger guy. I wanted to be, to be easy to get inside the shelter, but you're right. It would allow a lot, way too much heat out. You know what I noticed? One thing though is my door is a little bit on the lower side of my, my shelter, whereas yours is kind of up high. And knowing that heat rises, if you think of a hot air balloon rising with that hot air, I think you'd lose a lot of heat if we had it up too high. I bet if we combined the good ideas from both of our drawings, we would have a really nice shelter. Let's do it. Let's collaborate. Okay. Hey, and now that we've come up with some ideas that work and some ideas that don't, why don't you take all this knowledge and draw your own shelter while we're doing ours? Remember to consider heat loss from conduction. How can you minimize that? Remember to consider what structural features you design so heat is not lost due to convection and think about where you should put that insulation. Fun fact, did you notice earlier that I was shivering in the video? Why do we shiver when we're cold? Shivering is our body's natural response to cold temperatures. Our muscles start to expand and relax in order to burn calories, thus producing more heat from within. Our bodies strive to stay at a constant core temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So next time you're shivering on a cold winter's day, instead of complaining, just be glad that your body's doing its natural thing to keep you warm and ultimately keep you alive. Welcome down to our shelter building area here at Sly Park. Uh, we have our design here. So uh, this is basically what we came up with as our collaboration uh, between our two designs that you saw earlier. Um, so you see the tree right here. We have uh, what we refer to as uh, our main beam or our ridge pole. We have our insulation that we decided on. We moved our door down lower. Um, and we have our rock down here for uh, part of our foundation, and uh, I think we're ready to build. You ready to build? I'm ready to build. Let's do it. Strong tree for support. Ridge pole. Strong rock for support. That's our ribs to form our walls. The forest provides natural insulation. The more we can stop those air molecules from transferring heat, the better. Snow can also function as insulation as we pack it in. We're just trying to keep heat from escaping from inside that shelter. And just remember, the darker your shelter is on the inside, the 
more of that heat's being retained. Okay, so our shelter is built. I'm going to take my body inside and see what happens to the heat. Probably best to go in feet first. Smallest door possible. And remember to have door materials that you can then close yourself in once you're inside. in here. So here we're looking at the side of the shelter. There's that, that, that cover on the door that Fern inserted to keep that radiant heat from escaping out. We have our snow on the outside as well as some forest duff layers. So we're looking at some pine needles and other solar panels that the trees around here provide. Uh, a little bit of bark and even some dirt mixed in there. When you're building shelters, be prepared to, to get dirty. It happens. Uh, Fern's in there right now heating it up, but just remember that insulation layer is preventing that, that convection heat, preventing the walls from our shelter from getting too cold and causing that, that, that heat to rise and the cold air to be sucked in. So the more of that insulation, the better. And as I said earlier, uh, if, if you remember, the darker it is inside, the better. Because any, any ways that light's traveling inside our shelter, heat's going to be escaping out those same channels. So in just a second, we're gonna be testing it out using this thermal imagery uh, a thermometer right here. Basically, it's a handheld device that kind of measures the radiant heat escaping from our shelter. So let's go ahead and try it out. So as we're pointing down at the door, you can see that we have some heat escaping from the door, but good thing we placed that cover over it to prevent some of that from escaping. But for the most part, when you're looking at one of these, by the way, the red sections on the screen are the, the sections that are showing more heat, more of that radiant heat escaping out of our shelter. So when I'm scanning back and forth, I can see that I don't see a bunch of that red. Yeah, the bluer and the greener sections mean that it's typically colder. And so has our shelter served its purpose? I think for the most part it has. Do I think we could survive one night in the Sierra? I think so. Hopefully by the end of this video, you've learned that thermal energy is released as radiation from our bodies as we burn calories. The thermal energy comes in three forms. Conductive heat. Think of the rock transferring heat to my cold body. Convection currents. Think of hot air rising around a campfire and drawing in cold air behind it. And last but not least, think of radiation of heat. Think of the feeling as you come across a hot pan on a stove and feeling the heat from its handle before you ever touch it. That's the radiation of heat. And lastly, you now have foundational ideas when building your own survival shelter in the future and how to retain heat and ultimately stay alive. Are you ready for the Pillow Fort Survival Challenge? Step one, build site. Get permission and ideas for an ideal shelter building location from your parents. Step two, gather building materials, one pencil and one sheet of paper for planning purposes. Pillows, give structure to walls and serve as insulation. Chairs serve as a foundation for walls and ceilings. Blankets serve as an excellent insulation by slowing down heat transfer. One flashlight for testing purposes. Any material that gives structure to or insulates you from the cold. Step three, design phase. With your supplies in mind, start the construction process by designing a model of your planned pillow fort shelter build. Using the pencil paper gathered earlier, be sure and label as many features and building materials as possible to assist in the building process. Keep in mind that safety is always important and never place heavy objects above you as you build, especially to hold up blankets. Be sure and consult an adult for approval of your design before starting any construction. Step four, build. Follow the design you came up with in the planning process and make needed changes as challenges arise and don't hesitate to ask for help when needed. Step five, test. Once complete, it's time to test your pillow fort. Use the flashlight gathered during step two of this build to test your shelter's ability to hold heat. In a dark room, turn the flashlight on and place it inside your shelter. 
exit the shelter and look for beams of light exiting the walls of your build. Any avenues of light exiting your shelter represent passages where heat will escape too. Imagine the beams of light exiting the walls of your shelter as a visual representation of radiant heat. Did your shelter perform the way you expected? Imagine having to survive a cold winter's night outside. Did your fort trap radiant heat escaping from your body? Is your entrance allowing heat to escape and cold air to enter through convection? Does the floor have proper insulation to prevent conduction of cold temperatures from the ground up? Step six, camp out. If given permission, test your shelter by spending the night. Throughout the night, gauge your overall comfort. Were you cold at any point throughout the night? Did you retain enough radiant heat? Step seven, demolition. With safety in mind, take down your shelter, taking special note to return all building materials to where you found them. And great job. Hey, always remember to keep safety in mind, but it's time for the demolition. All right, I'm gonna do a five count. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, goodness. <laughs> what? And she's down. Oh, let's redo that scene. <laughs> <laughs> Take two. That Take was two. your line. <laughs>